So keys to opening communities to greater participation. We talked before about how the strongest communities, the best communities, are the ones that are inclusive. That if it's just one kind of people in a community, it can actually do some damage. Uh, and that oftentimes, you know, and when I'm working with local governments and other places, say, why do we want to partner with the community? And when I listen to them, they're talking about the same 10 or 15 people or they're in every city of the world who have really big mouths and very small constituencies. And I say, I speak for the community and nobody's behind them. Right? And they often think, that, think of those few individuals as if they are the community, because they're the ones they see all the time. They don't provide a lot of value, right? And so they sort of wonder, like, why do we want to partner with the community? And I say the problem isn't that we have too many people, it's we have too few. And we really need to build broad and inclusive engagement, because that's the only way this stuff works. It doesn't work if it's a few self, you can't have a few people being community. It's got to be everybody. So here's some of the keys I've learned about how to get more people engaged in community. And it's not rocket science. It's really simple, but I think we often forget it. And the first lesson I learned is the importance of having fun. Absolutely critical. I got a friend who says, Jim, the problem getting people involved in community is those GD activists. And I said, GD? What are you talking about? He said, the grim and determined. <laughs> the people who are always negative all the time, who just like to complain and bitch. And some people go with that negativity, but most people get involved because they have a sense of hope. It's like, why did you get involved unless you think you make a difference? And in many ways, those GD activists become the gatekeepers and keep everybody else away. You know, a lot of the uh, presidents of the ratepayers associations, or whatever they're called here, the community associations have been around for years. And they're just always negative, right? I got another friend who says, why have a meeting when you can have a party? <laughs> Think about it. The purpose isn't who can endure the most suffering. <laughs> the purpose is to build relationships. Right? And can't you build relationships a lot more through fun than you can through meetings? And yeah, we always resort to meetings as a way to try to bring people together. It's really stupid. <laughs> so here's a, a story about a community that learned how to have fun. This is in Elgin, Illinois. Uh, this is a suburb of Chicago. And, I, and they were taking me around the, the neighborhood. And I saw this big blue wooden tulip in front of somebody's house. And I said, what's the story with the blue wooden tulip? And they told me the story. They said, there's this guy who, who collects junk. And he can't help himself, and he collects all this junk, and his wife gets on his case, makes him take all the junk back to the dump. But every time he returns from the dump, he's got more junk than what he left. <laughs> Some of you know this guy. <laughs> and he went one time, and he found this gigantic blue wooden tulip. And he said, man, that is too good to let go to waste. <laughs> so he brought it back home, and he planted it in his front yard, and he told all the neighbors, come over Friday night, because I'm having a blue tulip party. <laughs> and neighbors are curious because they never heard of a blue tulip party before, but they were curious, so they came over. They had the best time. They had a great time. Here's the blue tulip. They had barbecue. There was a band playing. They met all their neighbors. They had so much fun that the next Friday night, that blue tulip showed up in front of somebody else's house. <laughs> and that blue tulip now it's been traveling around the city of Elgin for 10 years. Oh. Every Friday night in front of somebody else's house. Wow. And all week long, the neighbors are walking around trying to figure out where's the boo tulip going to be this week. Mm. Right? It's built community in a way nothing else could have because it's fun, it's engaging, it's not drudgery. <laughs> right? Yeah, Robert Putnam, you know, wrote the book, a professor at Harvard University wrote a book called Bowling Alone about the incredible breakdown of community life in North America. He said the number one thing breaking down community is television. He wrote the book a few years ago, so he would add all kinds of social media now probably. But, he, um, but he, he said, you know, people say they don't have time for community, and yet people spend an average of three or four hours a day in front of a television set. So I keep thinking if television is our biggest competition, and we're losing. Have you watched any television lately? <laughs> I mean, if you can't make community more interesting, more satisfying, we're doing something terribly wrong. And I think 
And I think the key is how do we how do we lighten up? How do we make it really engaging for people? And video games, I, I recently heard a researcher report that young people are spending an average of 10 to 12 hours a day in front of screens of all types. You know? And social media, somebody said, can be a great way to kind of reinforce those personal connections. It just can't be a substitute. And for many people, it's just focusing in front of these one-way screens. And there's no interaction. There's... So you know, the challenge is, how do we make community more engaging? Let's step up to the challenge. It shouldn't be that hard. Okay? Second lesson learned about getting people engaged is the importance of starting where people are. And several people talked about that this morning. That the closer you involve people to where they live, the more likely they are to get engaged. Right? You may get more people out citywide than you would in a particular neighborhood. You may get more people out for a neighborhood gathering than you would on a, on, on a block. But you're never going to get as high a percentage of participation than if you involve people right on the street where they live. Because if it's citywide, people are going to say, hey, somebody else will do it. Okay. It's on your street. Who's going to step up and do it if you don't do it? And if you don't do it, your neighbor's going to know you're not involved. You're going to be in trouble. People tend to have relationships at the street level. That's the key to getting people engaged. And child care, transportation, all that's much easier. Uh, second part of starting where people are is to start with their language and culture. When I was doing community organizing, very multicultural community, I was really clear that I needed a translator, interpreter. But even if everybody's speaking English, we need to be clear we're speaking the same English that they're speaking. And increasingly, we use our increasingly professionalized, specialized language. We use terms like asset-based community development to mean something really simple, which is just build on your strengths. And when you use that kind of language, people don't know what we're talking about. And they think they don't have enough expertise. You know, we use this, this language to kind of set ourselves apart from the people. We're the experts. We know asset-based community development, right? Um, so we need to talk the language people talk. And be, uh, obviously start with their culture. I was organizing a very multicultural community. It took me a while to figure out why the large Jewish community wasn't showing up to our annual meetings on Saturday, right? <laughs> <laughs> Third, to focus on their networks. That oftentimes we're trying to get people to join our association. We think we're the only show in town. It might be the neighborhood association. And we forget that just about everybody's already organized. They just don't belong to our group. Just about everybody belongs to some kind of association, some kind of network, formal or informal. So when I, I was organizing in a, a low-income community, and I thought, God, these poor people don't have a voice with City Hall. Got to get them organized into a neighborhood association so they have a voice. Knocked on people's doors trying to recruit people. I had a lot of success, but it was a lot of work. And I finally woke up and realized everybody was already organized. And in this community, most people belong to faith-based groups. Now these faith-based groups, just as every other group, tend to be really segregated. There were the African American Baptists, and there were the German Lutherans, and the Jewish synagogue, and the Buddhist temple. But when we brought them all together, we had the full rainbow of the community. Something we never could have achieved in a single organization. And if you think about it, most associations tend to be one kind of people. There are very few associations that include everybody. And they try to be inclusive. Well, at least some of them do, and they do outreach, and they try to bring in people who are different. But people who are different don't feel that comfortable because the language has already been set, and the agenda is set, and the leadership is set, and the relationships are set. So people who are different don't feel that comfortable coming in. Right? So if you really want to build broad and inclusive engagement, you need to re reach out and identify the other key associations in the community, particularly those associations that involve people who are underrepresented in your association. Start looking for common interests and start bringing the different networks together. You're never going to get everybody to join the same organization. People only have so much time in their lives. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's really powerful. It's really powerful to reach out and identify, particularly those networks of people who are underrepresented in your network. What, what networks are they a part of? And don't overlook the really informal groups. Right? In my neighborhood, the strongest association is a group of seniors that does regular walk around the neighborhood for exercise. And they do it as a group so they feel safe. And as they're walking, they're sharing all the gossip. 
and they're observing everything going on. So if you want to know what's going on in my neighborhood, you, you don't contact the neighborhood association, you contact the senior walking group. But they don't have any bylaws, they don't have any formal leaders, <coughs> but it's a really powerful network. Same with the kids, you know, do skate, do, do, hang out at the skate park together. Just identifying those key people, those key groupings, a really important piece of organizing. Because then you don't have to go door to door all the time, just get one individual. You've got a whole networks of people. You've got the existing relationships that you can build on. Uh, fourth is to start with their passions. Too often times we lead with what we're passionate about, with our cause. And that's called mobilizing, right? Mobilizing people around whatever we think the issue is that everybody should care about. And then when people, or we, we mobilize around what our agency cares about. What we get paid to care about, or what we got a grant to care about. And then when nobody joins us, we say, God, people are apathetic, <laughs> right? Nobody's apathetic. Everybody cares deeply about something. So if you really want to get people engaged, it's much better to start with a question than with an answer. Right? What keeps you awake at night? What are your dreams for your family, for your community? If you can tap into what people care about and give them a sense they can do something about it, they're much more likely to get involved than if you spend a lot of time trying to convince them to care about what you care about. Okay. Um, and then for their fifth, to start with their call. I learned this from a friend who's a duck hunter. And my duck hunting friend taught me, my wife hates this, she's a bird watcher, right? But she, uh, the principle's the same. Every duck will respond to a call. There's just a different call for every type of duck, right? So there's one for the loons, there's one for the coots, there's one for the mergansers, one for the wood ducks, one for the, what else, what, the, what kind of ducks do you have here? Mallards. Mallards, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So there's one for the mallards. Every duck has its own call. And my friend says, too often times, we just sound, in our outreach, we just sound the loon call. And we wonder why only loons show up at our meetings. <laughs> you get what you call. Right? <laughs> and too often times, that call is the meeting call. Not the main call, which would be kind of interesting, but the main call. <laughs> and for most people, that's the worst call in the world. They know they come to that first meeting, they're going to be on the sign-in sheet and sent to meetings for the rest of their life. <laughs> and a lot of people don't see results from meetings. One meeting just leads to another meeting, leads to another meeting, nothing ever happens. And a lot of people are shy, and they're told, look, if you really care about your community, you're going to come to our meeting. So they come, but they just sit there. They don't feel like they're contributing anything. That's how much they care, they actually show up. So if we really want to get everybody engaged, we need to use all the calls. For the person who's shy, they may feel comfortable as a volunteer, you know, tutoring or mentoring somebody, making a difference in somebody's life, one-on-one. -on -one. Social call, we know that works. We know people come out for food, for music, <laughs> for dance, parties. And we shouldn't apologize, because the purpose is to build relationships. One of my favorite calls is a project call. Because with projects, unlike with meetings, it's a short-term commitment. It's not a life sentence. There's always a result. There's a role for absolutely everybody. For young people, elders, people with disabilities, artists, construction workers, architects, everybody. People would never come to the meetings. And in the process, people build relationships. And once people build relationships, then they're more likely to come to some meetings. Because you need a few meetings, too. But we always lead with the meetings and wonder why the same people keep showing up. Right? If we really want to get broad and inclusive engagement, we need to use all the calls. This is a story from Darwin about the importance of starting where people are, just to illustrate that. Do you know Darwin? Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah. Good. <laughs> So it's kind of a, a rural area around there, but it's about 50,000 people, I think, in, in, in Darwin. And they wanted to figure out how to uh, create more inclusive community. So they came up with a really creative idea. They bought some cheap uh, living room furniture, just enough to fit in the back of a van. So they bought a coffee table and a rug and a, a, a stuffed cat 
And they set it up, and now they have a sofa too, and they call it the Idea Sofa. And it, people are just kind of lured over it because it looks so strange. And when people come over, they're invited to sit down on the sofa and share their idea for what would make for a better Darwin. And everybody who has an idea is invited to come to the school on, on a Saturday afternoon to a workshop to develop their idea into a proposal. And at the end of the workshop, they, do, they pitch their idea to the whole room. And everybody in the community votes which project they're going to support with up to a thousand pounds and their time. And so it's brought all kinds of new energy and new leaders, people who had never been involved before. And these women came together to form a soldier support group, cleaning up the local cemetery. Young people came together to form a, an environmental group and a green cycle program. They worked to clean up the local estate, plant daffodils everywhere. Worked to build a skate park. Organized the Scarecrow Festival. But they had 37 projects in the first six months. And most of them were led by people who had never been active before. Because they went where the people were. They went to those bumping places. Knowing those bumping places is really critical. Where is it people gather? Where can you find the people? Rather than always expecting the people to come to us, around our idea, around our project, we go where the people are and listen to what's important to them. The more they own it, the more they're going to make it happen. Uh, I was in you know, Appledore a few months ago in the Netherlands, and they fixed up this old milk truck. And they had music blaring out of it. They, they parked it in the, in the city square. And they have these little uh, shelves here where you can um, get snacks, free snacks. So it attracts all kinds of young people. <laughs> and then they fix it up really cool inside. So there's a, a kitchen table, there's a kitchen, there's uh, computers. And young people come in and they're invited to share their dream for the community. And then they put the dream in a can, and they put an expiration date on the can. And then they, um, they team the young person up with a mentor who can help them realize their dream. So this young man uh, was, you know, there's bicycles all over the Netherlands. And a lot of them have been scrapped. So he's taking scrap bicycles and making art and making furniture out of them. And so he, that was his dream, and he got teamed up with a business person who helped him develop a business plan for how to market those. And this guy's a hip-hop artist, and he wanted to create a concert venue downtown for the young people, so he's uh, hooked up with a number of people who are helping to carry out that dream. But all kinds of people, new people are getting involved because they went where the people were and listened to their ideas, their passions, rather than always expecting young people to come join the resident association, which will never happen, right?